pretty eyes, pretty thighs, shawty she a dime, demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies. Today, it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Ken Poth, James B. Duke Professor of Cell Biology and Director of the Regeneration Next Initiative at Duke University. So Dr. Poth, and thank you for being part of this episode. As a trailblazer in your field, can you bring us back and tell everyone about your educational background? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, it's, um, I'm looking forward to today. I think it'll be fun. Um, mm-hmm. As far as... Uh, Uh, background in education. I, I don't know, you know, in, in biology, the path we go to takes about, you know, it takes about 28 grades. So, so I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll try to be concise, but you know, I'm, I'm originally from uh, Northern Wisconsin and I, I grew up really interested in whatever I could find in ponds and creeks and fields. And so, um, you know, I was attached to biology very early on. Uh, I went to Carleton College, which was small school in, uh, in Minnesota. And uh, it's there I, I, I was fortunate to connect really strongly with um, one of my biology uh, professors, John Tomasco. And uh, we were studying projects on RNA splicing, you know, the um, finalization of messages in the cells. And uh, um, a great opportunity to spend 30 hours a week 40 hours a week in lab as an undergrad and, and um, uh, um, it really hit home that, um, that I wanted to do research. Um, so after Carleton, I went right away to MIT um, to a PhD program in, in biology. And um, there I worked with Susumu Tonegawa who had, um, who had won the, the Nobel prize earlier for um, for figuring out the uh, the diversity of um, of, of our ant- antibodies, how that how that works, and uh, but he it, his passion at the time was trying to understand how we how we learn, how we acquire uh, memories, and um, and using genetics in mouse models to to try to understand this. And I, I thought that was um, you know just a, a really exciting question uh, to be going after, and. Um, uh, for about five years or so, um, uh, my my work investigated potential roles of uh, of gases, um, in particular carbon monoxide, in learning and memory and, and uh, other roles in the body. And so then after that is when I got excited about regeneration, and I joined Mark Keating's lab, uh, starting my postdoctoral research. This is after the PhD, and that was at the University of Utah, and, and later at at Harvard Medical School when the lab moved. And this is where um, you know, we started studying how zebrafish regenerate things, fins, heart muscle, uh, we study other tissues now. And um, uh, about 18 years ago or so is when I moved from there to, to Duke where, where I am today and, and where my lab uh, thinks about regeneration day and night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bet you talked about your doctor Vass advisor of Dr. Tonagawa, uh, you know, in what specific ways did your experience learning from this noble lottery help further your career in regenerative medicine? Well, um, it was more generally in, in research and in science and biology where I think, you know, his, his influence was the strongest. I mean, he, he was and is fearless. You know, we'll study anything, not afraid to completely change direction and just follow what's exciting, follow the science Mm -hmm. and um, comfortable both in an open space where there aren't many other scientists investigating um, the question, but also comfortable in a highly competitive space, you know, where where there are many people interested in in the same questions. And, um, you know, I I think one, one of the, the, the best pieces of advice he gave me was, was to, to think ahead in, in what, what you study. And when you, when you think about questions to pursue in your career, mm-hmm. think about what, what people aren't looking at now, but, um, 
what what um, is important and um, what people will be thinking about scientifically in, in 10 years or 15 years. And, and that is that is actually how I um, you know really shaped my decision mm -hmm. uh, to, to study regeneration. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if, if we think back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it it was interesting, but it, it was not um, nearly as popular then as it is now. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and and so um, it, was, it was a great decision. Um, again, inspired by by his advice. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, no, you're a pioneer in the use of zebrafish to study vertebrate tissue regeneration. Now, the point is, I want to go and There's like many other animals that have tissue, tissue like disabilities, sea cucumbers, flatworms, and there's many more. So, why did you particularly choose to study zebrafish when there are so many other species that have the, the exact same ability? Yeah, it's, well, it's a great question, and um, the you know the classic models for understanding regeneration are, are salamanders, newts, as you've said, and that, and we've known about their ability to regenerate for two hundred fifty years in, mm -hmm. in published work. Um, flatworms, hydra, these polyps, and and they're great models, and um, there there's wonderful science being done now, very strong mm -hmm. mechanistic science, but you know ze zebrafish. Um, yeah, I'm biased. I think they're special. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's uh, there's been for um, 30 years or so a very large community of zebrafish researchers, mainly studying how they how they develop as embryos. I mean, they they develop incredibly quickly. Um, they're transparent, and you can maintain tens, hundreds of thousands of of these animals in a in a relatively small space in a lab. So there's a great, there's a, they're a great lab model. They, um, um, they breed and give rise to a couple of hundred eggs every week. Um, oh, and, every week. Um, and so the, 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 um, the ability to raise a number of animals, the fact that the community is generating new tools for the ge genetics and zebrafish. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, all that coming together with their ability to regenerate spinal cord and heart and fins. I mean, it's just a, it's a great marriage of regeneration and, and genetics and community. And, um, I, you know, I, I think, um, I think it's still a great time to be getting into zebrafish, but I, I think what's, what's made it better are the number of comparative approaches now where, where, uh, folks are, are looking at not only, mm -hmm fish and salamanders and worms, but, but um, they're bringing new model systems into, into play to, to think about regeneration. Yeah, so I throw out number was, but that zebra, uh, no, I never knew zebra fish had that, they could have that many eggs in a week. So I mean, my question is, if there's that many eggs in, in a week, so, so your lab probably is tanks. So is, is, is there gonna be a problem of like overflowing fish in the tank? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's a it's a a great system for raising zebrafish. And I, I don't know um, uh, if you've been to a facility or could visit one nearby, but it's kind of like a library of tanks. And uh, zebrafish are native to parts of India, but um, and they're not used to pristine conditions. But mm -hmm. we keep them pretty happy. We we. We have water that's continually recirculating and being purified and sterilized. And they, they naturally won't breed in the tanks. So we can take them out, set them up on a shelf in breeding tanks. And the next morning, they'll, they'll mate, fertilize, um, fertilize eggs. We collect the embryos and we, we raise them separately. So it's a lot more orderly than, uh, than you'd think. And, and we, okay. we keep control of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your lab, sure, the board, your lab spearheaded the use of zebrafish to review concepts and mechanisms of regeneration, and then you established zebrafish as a model of innate heart regeneration. So my question is, you know, what abilities do zebrafishes have that in order to uh, regener uh, regenerate tissues that humans don't? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, that uh, zebrafish, uh, other vertebrates like salamanders. When you when you think about comparing them to humans or mammals in generally, one thing that's important to point out is that 
pretty much everything can regenerate to some extent. You know, we, we can regenerate our, our liver um, incredibly well. Um, skeletal muscle, um, like after um, a snake bite or, or mm -hmm. some type of, of injury, our, you know, our blood, skin, intestinal epithelium. So a lot of things regenerate in humans, mm -hmm. but when you look at zebrafish, they've got that and more. They've got um, these tissues regenerating, but also um, you can remove um, a, a high percentage um, of heart muscle uh, up to 50% or more, and um, they can regenerate that. We, we can't, we have a, a minimal, if, um, if uh, not really even measurable uh, capacity for heart regeneration mm -hmm. that, that goes across you know, all, all mammals that have been tested. Um, spinal cord regeneration, you can, you can completely transect and paralyze, um, uh, completely transect the spinal cord of an adult zebra fish, paralyze the animal, but within two months, they'll be swimming, you know, like nothing ever happened. Um, and um, you can injure parts of the, you know, parts of the brain. Uh, they can regenerate um, append their major appendages. So it's, it's more, when you think about it, um, they've, got, they've got what we have and they have this elevated capacity. They've got another set of tissues that can do, do it just as well as, as our best tissues. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's actually interesting. Um, so you said that, you know, uh, so, you know, you said that new discoveries in zebrafish, they have the potential to impact clinical outcomes of many, um, of many uh, the, the, the diseases of organ damage, including heart failure, Alzheimer's and diabetes. So uh, I knew your Dr. Jean Lauren, a stem cell biologist, her company asking neuroscience is going to test their new like, stem cell therapy to potentially heal Parkinson's something similar to Alzheimer's. So do you think stem cells will have an even bigger part in regenerating tissues in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, the uh, stem cell biology is, uh, you know, it's one of the tenets of regeneration. You know, from the regenerative biology side, we, we consider stem cells to be um, a, a method to achieve regeneration. It's one of, one of the ways that um, many of our tissues go about day-to-day -day regeneration, like the intestinal epithelium or hair, hair follicles or, or skin or blood. Um, but it's also an essential way to activate major tissue replacement. Um, not, all, not all tissues utilize stem cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, liver mainly regenerates through the growth and the division of existing hepatocytes, existing liver cells. For heart regeneration, I think the field is, um, uh, is comfortable with the idea that, that we don't have endogenous stem cells in our heart of any significant regenerative activity. So um, I think uh, for many cases, like uh, when one wants to generate new neurons uh, or, um, certainly in the case of a bone marrow transplant or, um, or other contexts, working with stem cells and stem cell transplantation is, is the best way to go. Um, but I think with other tissues, uh, it's important to recognize maybe those that don't, don't have a, a, a robust stem cell population mm -hmm. that you've got you've to think of other ways. And um, these might be molecular therapies. They might be um, adding drugs that, that stimulate the division of cells and stimulate better healing, or, uh, or they might be gene therapies uh, that use uh, the delivery of, uh, of, um, of, of cassettes that, that encode factors that can, can stimulate the process. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's a few ways to go about um, doing it. And um, you know, what's key is it depends on understanding the biology of the tissue that, um, that, you're, that you're trying to, uh, trying to manipulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your lab studied initially morphogenesis and injury induced regeneration of several tissues in zebrafish. You guys investigate adult hearts, fins, spinal cords, uh, scales, and other tissues. So you also began to test this ideas in, in, in mammals, right? So scientists have they've been able to regenerate the spinal cord of a mouse. So is your lab going to regenerate spinal cord for apes or monkeys in, in the future? I don't know if, you know, I don't know if our lab is going to, <laughs> is, 
is going to do that. We are a lab that, I mean, it, we focus on understanding the basic mechanisms of, of how regeneration works in, it, in its strongest settings, like, like in zebrafish. So if, if we can understand those mechanisms, what are cells doing? What are populations of cells doing? What are the mm -hmm. key factors? Then, then yeah, that, then you get great context for understanding how, uh, how it works uh, in mammals. But, you know, I think that um, uh, one of the, the aspects of, of regeneration that's underexplored and that we can learn more about uh, from zebrafish that can, can ultimately direct therapies is, uh, is control. Mm -hmm. You can't um, necessarily expect to add stem cells back as a big bolus in a syringe or, um, mm -hmm. or add a drug to an entire animal or even pump it in locally mm -hmm. and um, expect perfect repair mm -hmm. like in the natural context. Um, in a natural context, animals have control mechanisms that can be turning on hundreds or even thousands of genes or turning them off in specialized ways that we don't understand. And all of that uh, together leads, leads to regeneration of complex tissue, like, like a spinal cord. So um, I think we can, you know, we'll be able to study how regeneration works for, for decades. I think that some tissues, maybe the heart, are closer uh, to, to real regenerative medicine where, where you can replace muscle faster than scar tissue forms and um, function of the heart can, can be restored, which is the goal of regenerative medicine for the heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, other tissues like, like limb regeneration, mm -hmm. imagine regenerating something as specialized you know, as a shoulder length amputation. That you need to know you need to know how regeneration works at some depth and how, how genes are controlled and the timing of it. And that, that's gonna take, um, you know, that's gonna take cer certainly a lifetime. And so um, uh, I, I think, um, you know, to your question, um, there's, there's exciting evidence uh, in spinal cord regeneration that um, there can be some, some factors Put together that improve regeneration, say in neonatal mouse models, and um, but I think there's a there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more to learn. Yeah, and then speaking of spinal cord or no no spinal cord of regeneration, uh, I know when someone loses their spinal cord, they basically can't walk again. I think so. My question is, you know, why does an effective spinal cord you know cure also require a combination of molecular, cellular, electrostimulatory, and, 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 and um, engineering approaches. I think because this is, um, when you think about the size of the human spinal cord and what it controls mm -hmm. and the severity of say, a, you know, a, let's say a crush injury to the spinal cord that, that in, in many cases that it does cause permanent uh, paralysis. Again, you're asking, you're asking a lot um, and you've got to go at this kind of problem from many directions. And mm -hmm. I don't think any of us, so certainly in regenerative biology, our direction would be to try to find key factors and how they're controlled mm -hmm. and to try to, um, try, try to take, take what we've learned from a permissive environment like a fish mm -hmm. and try to recreate that in a, in a mammal and let's say in a setting, a spinal cord injury and, and ultimately in a human, but uh, that on its own, um, you know, has a, has a number of, of challenges and it's probably naive. Um, when you think of bringing engineering into the mix, you think of biomaterials that can help with the delivery of those factors and help with the environment, mm -hmm. make it more, pro-regenerative, um, maybe reduce the, the division and the proliferation of, of cells that um, have more of a scarring effect and, and promote the, the growth of axons across, across the lesion. Um, and so that's, that's clearly important. And when you think of electrostimulatory approaches, you think of uh, 
the same time you're doing this, still try to train the body to rely more on the, the circuits that are intact. And that can, that can only help, but maybe on its own, it's not enough. So I, I just think with a, with a problem so challenging, um, I, I think that um, you know, there's a trend in the field of getting people together, specialists from, from different topics. So engineers, clinicians, basic um, scientists like myself and, and many others. And um, I, th I, think, I think we're now understanding that going to the, the highest level in each of these disciplines uh, is, is important, but on its own, it, it, it still might, might, not, um, might not be enough. And so one has to, has to consider strongly bringing these together. Yeah. Um, so you, you asked, you have experimental spinal cord of regeneration in zebrafish. So you, you recently reported a factor called the connective tissue growth factor, the CTGF that is induced in an apparently new population of, uh, uh glial cells that participate in the early, earliest, um, bridging events. So what is the CTGF and do humans have this factor in our body? Yes. So connective tissue growth factor is, um, it's a, it's a protein that's secreted into um, the extracellular space. Um, it interacts with a number of signaling pathways uh, that ulti ultimately um, affect the behavior of cells and the expression of genes within cells. And in fact, um, it has many different functions and proposed roles, including uh, not just regeneration, but, but also in, um, in more detrimental uh, um, uh, outcomes like scarring. So uh, in the case of spinal cord regeneration, uh, we've seen this as a marker of so-called glial cells, as you mentioned, very, very early cells that kind of stretch out across the lesion site. And in that model, uh, in the case of zebrafish, these early cells that bridge that, that lesion site are, um, are thought to act as a scaffold for, for axons uh, from, from neurons that can then cross that bridge and find their, their targets again. So we, we see this um, CTGF as a, as a factor that uh, promotes that very early step of forming that bridge in those in those bridging glial cells. We certainly don't see it as the only factor, but, um, um, and, but we see it as a, a bridging factor. Other, other factors um, that are out there that we and others are looking for still have to uh, account for um, limiting the, the scarring or the proliferative response of, of, um, of, of other populations of glial cells. Um, factors have to promote axon growth across the lesion, and they have to be placed in the in the the right part of the lesion so that they're they're directed to their targets. So, um, you know, for us, we've only been studying spinal cord regeneration for a handful of years, but uh, first of all, I, I I think it's you know one of the most spectacular events that one can study if you think about all that's happening and and. And you think about an animal recovering from paralysis, but I also think it's really understudied, and um, there's a lot of space there to explore. Mm -hmm. And I think I think the field is going to find some surprising things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you also develop a new program to harness the remarkable innate ability of zebrafish to generate a severe spinal cord. So, can you explain more about your new program? I think the the program. Uh, uh, is like our other programs. And, um, you know, in zebrafish, you have the opportunity to uh, apply a number of different genetic approaches to a system that naturally regenerates spinal cord. And I think, you know, what's exciting about doing genetics today is something I'm, I expect you've covered on your show, and that is CRISPR-Cas9 based. Yes, uh, we just, yeah, we just covered it right before you actually, Dr. Luciano Verafini is covering uh, book about yeah. CRISPR, so. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's timely then. I mean, this is, um, 
this, this has been huge for those of us um, who study genetic model systems that haven't yet had, say, let's say seven or eight years ago, the great genetic approaches to be able to, to, to create mutations in any gene that we want. Now, now we can. So if one has a hypothesis that gene X is required for spinal cord regeneration, mm -hmm. one can make a, a mutant in zebrafish and test that hypothesis and, and go down the line um, looking at dozens or dozens of genes. And um, if one wants to uh, do some, something like visualize the, um, the expression of a gene during spinal cord regeneration, one can use the same technologies and insert a, a fluorescent protein gene cassette, again, pretty much anywhere in the genome, and to use those to visualize by fluorescence how a, a, a gene normally behaves during spinal cord regeneration. So I think you know, it's, 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 a, it's a better time than it's ever been for studying regeneration in large part because of the genetics and the, the ways one can manipulate the, the genome to, to visualize mm -hmm and to understand the roles of different genes uh, in regenerative events. And I, I think, you know, zebrafish, it's, uh, it's been a godsend. Yeah, I can't un underestimate. I can't overstate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your lab's also heavily involved in heart regeneration. So my question is, you know, you know how are zebrafish able to regenerate new muscle loss after major cardiac um, injury? Yeah, how, well, that's, that's the goal is to understand that. How do they do that? And, you know, we... We've learned some of the basic um, uh, mechanisms uh, for heart regeneration over the past 20 years or so um, that, um, uh, that I, I think um, tell us what, you know, tell us what we, we, we need to understand further. And that, that is largely what the cells are doing. So heart regeneration in zebrafish, the central event is, um, is the proliferation of muscle cells that are spared. So when one thinks about regeneration, um, probably in any system, you, you wanna understand what the source of the new tissue is, mm -hmm. whether it's stem cells, like you mentioned earlier, or, or it's something else. So for innate heart regeneration, as it happens in zebrafish, we don't find any evidence that there's a stem cell population that makes muscle, mm -hmm. but just the muscle cells that are spared divide. Uh, so one of the key questions is understanding, well, how, how do they do that? Why do they do that? Why don't our muscle cells and our hearts do that um, as readily? And uh, that, that's, a, that's a central goal for many of the labs. Um, other questions uh, that we've worked on is understanding, well, what are the other cell types doing in the heart that give this permissive environment for regeneration? And those could be blood vessels, nerves, immune cells, could be this great layer that wraps the heart called the epicardium. And it could be a layer of cells on the inside of the heart called the endocardium. What, what are those doing? And, and so we've been exploring those as, as of others in the field mm -hmm. because they, they release the factors and they provide the environment that um, allows heart muscle cells uh, to, to divide and ultimately to produce muscle at a faster rate than the scar tissue that's trying to form at the same time. Um, and if, you know, if I'll add this, you know, I, I think um, when you think ab about what zebrafish and study of heart regeneration in this system have, has provided for uh, us understanding the possibility of heart regeneration in mammals, that, that, that source question is key. Um, and uh, for many years, folks have been trying to um, identify, stimulate, and force a stem cell population to make heart muscle, let's say in mice or in injured pig hearts. But um, now the majority of the field is trying to make the mouse heart or the rat heart or the pig heart do what a fish heart does. And that is to make their cardiomyocytes divide and to produce more muscle through that method. Mm -hmm. And so it's an exciting time in the field for that. Yeah, I mean, you know, many scientists have talked to Dr. Sean Wu. Uh, they've been trying stem cells to regenerate a uh, heart, and they talked about myocytes, but 
Why is cardiac generation you know, not really based on stem cells, but it's based on you no know, cardiac myocytes? It's that what the why question is, you know, it's always tough. Why? I mean, first of all, why, why, why can't we regenerate our hearts? Yeah, exactly. Why can fish do it? We can talk about that uh, uh, if, if you want, although again, no one really has the answers to that, but yeah, you would expect the heart would have stem cells. You know, 50, 60 years ago, um, the satellite s- stem cell was for skeletal muscle was, was essentially discovered just by looking at electron micrographs of, of skeletal muscle and saying, well, this, this, this probably is a stem cell. And then, a, you know, a, two decades of experiments uh, essentially proved that, that, that it was, but, 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 but heart muscle doesn't have an embedded population with, with stem cell features or that have been shown in, in experiments you know, recently, again, the, the vast majority of the field doesn't believe there are cardiac stem cells of any biological significance. Um, but I don't think there's a great, there's a great answer to wh- why the heart doesn't have them. You know, our, our heart muscle cells can live for 70, 80 years. We can have the same heart muscle cells uh, when we die that, that we were born with, which is pretty amazing, right? So maybe, um, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of renewal going on to heart muscle. Now, there, there is evidence for a, a low level of renewal, half a percent a year or so, but um, it's not much replacement in the scheme of things when you think of the human lifetime. But still, you know, that, that question of why is what, you know, gets us going to work every day, but they're, they're the toughest questions mm-hmm. uh, to answer. Yeah, so you're in your lab, you guys have innovated many tools in this tissue regeneration. So can you explain more about these tools? Well, I, you know, I think that um, in the field of, of regeneration, um, and really, you know, almost any field of, of biology, you've got to, you've, you've got to be, um, position yourself with, uh, with tools to answer your questions. So for instance, if you think a certain gene is important, for regeneration, um, you've got to have the ability to remove the function of that gene and maybe in a certain cell type and maybe at a certain time in life, for instance, after an animal has gone through development and gotten to the adult stage. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I think the rate limiting step for any group and for any progress in regenerative regenerative biology is uh, being positioned with the right tools uh, to to ask your questions, and um, in zebrafish, we've just had the opportunity to uh, uh, to to make many different strains where we can, for instance, genetically kill or ablate, delete from the animal a certain cell type, and then we can ask whether that cell type is required for regeneration of the heart mm-hmm. or regeneration of fins. Um, you can create tools to genetically mark one cell and just watch it over time to see um, where its progeny uh, uh, end up in the animal, uh, what types of cells they become, what patterns they turn into. And um, I'm really excited about the ability these days to visualize live uh, the signaling of, let's say, int- intracellular uh, protein kinases. For instance, there, there are sensors now that fluoresce and their intensity of fluorescence can be um, quantified as a readout of the activity of a, of, a, of a protein in the cell. And so you can visualize thousands of cells during regeneration at once if you have the right imaging platform and you can quantify in each of those cells the amount of activity of a key protein. And that by visualizing, and we can talk about this more because I'm very excited about just looking at regeneration, but by visualizing the activity of of one protein across many cells, it can give you the idea of what type of control of signaling uh, a tissue needs in order to form a certain shape. 
<laughs> so tools is a very general term, but um, one needs them to ask questions and one needs them to visualize regeneration in the, in the, in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so your lab, you have a history of research findings on the epicardium, which is the outer layer of the heart and the beginning of discovery of his dynamism upon injury to his fate mapping to his bone releasing pro-regenerative uh, factors. So my question is, can you explain more what the epicardium is and why it has a role in releasing pro-regenerative uh, factors? Yeah, the epicardium is a, is a personal favorite um, tissue of mine. And it's one of those cell types that, um, um, as you said, it, it, it encases the... Uh, the heart, all vertebrate hearts have an epicardium and um, it hasn't gotten much attention uh, until the last 10 or 15 years or so because it's mainly thought, it's mainly thought of as some structure. And there are tissues like this that encase many tissues uh, of ours, you know, many organs uh, like liver or, or like our gut um, that also have not gotten the, the, the same type of attention as the you know, it's heart muscle or the hepatocytes. But um, the case of the epicardium, what, what we reported many years ago was that um, one inj- when one injures the heart or when the, so let's say someone has a heart attack or uh, in zebrafish, there's an experimental injury, this tissue is incredibly reactive and it starts turning on uh, a whole host of genes, both right next to the injury, but also really distant from the injury and so we first got excited about the epicardium because it was a, a very strong, very quick within hours response organ wide to an injury. But then within a day or so, and again, if you look at expression of different genes, um, this will tell you that that injury response localizes right to, to where the trauma is. Mm-hmm. And so the epicardium then starts secreting factors Um, That in the case of heart regeneration, for instance, some of these factors uh, are important for making muscle cells divide. Uh, Other factors may be important for helping that tissue get get vascularized. And the epicardium also makes cells called fibroblasts, which provide structure uh, for tissue that's regenerating. So, um, you know, we and, you know, people are studying the epicardium for for other uh, for other reasons as well. And uh, as a tissue on its own, it's, it's highly regenerative. If you deplete it, it will come back very quickly and reliably. So um, I think, you know, it's, when one thinks about, about tissue regeneration, even if we think the heart is simple compared, let's say, to the brain or to the limb, it's not. And there are many, many cell types in the heart that, mm-hmm. that have to be controlling their own gene programs, turning genes on and off that have to have orchestrated behavior of their own and um, in concert with uh, the other cell types of the heart. And, you know, this is why regeneration is a beautiful thing. The heart without an injury is beating away, not doing much. Genes are generally at a low level, um, you know, genes that would, would be turned on during regeneration, but you get this injury and then everything starts happening in these different cell types at once. They've all got to coordinate uh, with each other and um, it ends up with, with new muscle and with all of its components covered by an epicardium. Yeah, so we'll talk about the endocardium. Is how can the endocardium have also have um, multiple roles during um, heart regeneration? Well, for the, yeah, for the heart to function, um, it's not only got to make a new muscle and muscle will, replacing that muscle will provide Mm-hmm. contractile strength for the heart that um, it won't have with scar tissue. But once that, with, with the formation of muscle, you've also got to have protection and stability. For instance, um, the muscle can't just contact uh, the lumen where the blood is, but you've got to have the endocardium there uh, to separate uh, those tissues. And the endocardium, therefore, after an injury has to regenerate um, as well. It's got to make more and it's got to be lining and fill in, uh, uh, fill in the areas as the muscle regenerates. And we found it also 
um, it also um, expresses factors that uh, can promote regeneration and uh, just like the epicardium. And so when you, when you have a cardiac injury in zebrafish, in fact, you, you've got the endocardium and the epicardium kind of acting together to form to, or define this region where the, where the muscle regenerates. And, um, you know, I, th I think that um, it's, a, it's a concept that's there with, uh, with all types of regeneration. You've got to limit it and focus it to an area in the heart, that area is defined by the, um, uh, the uh, repaired and activated epicardium and the repaired and activated endocardium. Uh, other tissues will have um, similar regions that, that localize where regeneration should be taking place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your lab's also working on a pen dish of Regeneration. We talked. Uh, you talked a little bit about it. So, anything you say of how zebrafishes can regenerate fins, apart from what you've already explained before? Well, yeah. So we, we use fin regeneration as a as a similar model to limb regeneration. These are their major appendages, and um, they uh, fish, and in particular zebrafish, can regenerate fins really, really quickly, really reliably. And you have to be an expert to even tell if, if there, there was an injury. And um, we use that as a model to, I mean, to understand a number of concepts in, in, in regeneration. Um, first of all, the central structure in a regenerating limb or fin or even a, a flatworm head that uh, regenerates after it's been amputated. Um, this is a a proliferative mass of cells called a blastema. And a blastema has been compared um, loosely to, uh, 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 to even to a tumor. It's highly proliferative. It's got no shape really initially, but by contrast with what a tumor does, which would be to proliferate uncontrollably, maybe metastasize uh, a blastema for a limb or a fin or planarian head, um, proliferates under control and ultimately differentiates into the structures that were lost. And this could be skeletal bone as well. So um, understanding how that forms and how that cell proliferation is controlled is, I mean, it's a central question in, in limb or, or appendage regeneration generally. But there are a number of, 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 of exciting questions that you can get at with this model. Um, another is the idea of positional memory. And that is um, when a limb is amputated or a fin, how, do, how does an animal know what it's lost? And how does it retain that information to replace only the tissue that's been lost? And this is a centuries old question. And I would say we still don't, we still don't understand uh, that, but somehow this tissue is retained at the stump is retaining everything uh, that it needs to, um, you know, as a blueprint to, to recreate uh, a new elbow, um, wrist and hand. So um, zebrafish similarly to regenerate fins, they need to have uh, that blueprint. And uh, so it's a great model for, for studying questions like that. You know, uh, uh... <laughs> You no, know, all this zebrafish conversation I'd be interested in. It's like, you know, have people ever like, you know, you know, you have like zebrafish as a pet, like no pet fishes. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, I think this is how it, uh, it got um, adopted. So um, zebrafish were um, uh, the, the use of zebrafish as a model was pioneered by George Schweisinger in the, in the late sixties and seventies. Uh, at the University of Oregon, and um, many of the, the zebrafish used in labs today weren't necessarily taken from the wild by scientists, but um, they're available cheaply in pet stores. Oh. And um, you'll, you'll see them, in fact, um, you may, might be familiar with glowfish. These mm -hmm. are fish that have been engineered to um, express different fluorescent proteins and um, so you, you might see them in red or orange or, or green, but it's a very, it's a very hardy fish. 
it survives well in home aquaria and it survives well in a lab. And uh, again, although we treat them very well in our laboratories, um, they, um, they're, they're, um, uh, they're, uh, um, you, can, you can raise a lot of them. They're um, robust and uh, they regenerate really well uh, in addition. Well, yeah, I'm at my history of, you know, raising fishes <laughs> at home is, I had two and they all died. The, the point is, yeah, the point is like, you no, know, like after that, I, I, know I, have, I'm not, I wasn't really interested in fishes, but I guess zebra fish is something interesting. So I don't know. I may start raising a zebra fish. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they'll die on you as long no. as you keep the, they can, they can do okay in a fairly wide, I mean, just a room temperature, a little warmer. Um, and um, I don't think they'll die on you. They'll live for, three or four years or even more in a lab if you um if you're willing to take care of them for that long and uh, you know that's more than a mouse so it's um and and you, you might know many other fish live live much longer but mm. uh, i think i think you'll do okay with super fish <laughs> yeah yeah so human embryo is fewer than so i know you know you're on zebra fish but no i found that human embryo is fewer than eight weeks old they can fully like regenerate a lost limb just like the zebra fish. So like my, my question is like, what factors do embryos have that humans do not have in order to regenerate lost limbs? Well, so the, I think, you know, the field generally is in agreement that, um, uh, that um, there probably aren't any factors say that are unique to zebra fish or to salamanders, or at least it's not a large number of factors. Um, and um, it's more so the, uh, how the animal uses them, how, you know, it's a question of control. And um, certainly in the case of an embryo um, or an early neonatal animal, mm -hmm. um, the animal's in a growth phase. You know, it's, it's built to grow and um, many of its tissues aren't as, um, challenged by, um, you know, functional requirements as they are in the adult. The heart grows uh, in a mouse many, many fold in volume between mm -hmm. day one and day 21 of life. Uh, the brain undergoes massive changes. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, a model for um, biologists to have. Um, that is neonatal or fetal mammals, which generally show a higher regenerative capacity. And then that goes away at the adult stage. And even as adult mammals age, there's a, a lot of evidence that uh, many of our tissues can't um, repair uh, as well as uh, say in young adults. So um, it produces a, you know, a, great, a great number of additional models uh, to um, um, you know, to compare with zebrafish, to compare with salamanders, which generally continue to regenerate well between juvenile and adult and even, even older animals. Somehow in mammals, you know, we're, we're born with, and certainly before birth have this uh, reasonably high regenerative capacity in many of our tissues, but that becomes limited uh, as we age. And just, just a, a, a fascinating, um, fascinating biology, but also potentially really valuable for, for understanding what controls regeneration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So recently, you know, you introduced a con, uh, so you introduced a concept of tissue regeneration, enhanced elements, uh, you know, they're briefly called trees, you know, sequences that can regen regulate regeneration programs and can be engineered to enhance these, um, um, tissue re regeneration. So what are trees and are you going to commercialize this like concept eventually? Oh, um, yeah. Well, um, what, what trees are, and this, this relates well to the, to the last question. Um, these, these are short gene regulatory elements that will be uh, somewhere in the area of a gene. Let's say a gene that, um, normally increases its expression, its RNA levels during regeneration. Something's gotta, gotta control that. Some, some DNA sequence uh, has to interact with 
the promoter of that gene to control when it's being expressed. And so um, several years ago, um, we found that um, uh, there's a class of enhancers like this. And, um, you know, the enhancers have been studied for decades uh, as a way of controlling the expression of genes in, in embryos and in, in other develop in, in develop many development and disease contexts. But um, you know, we are we are excited about um, the fact that a gene expression during tissue regeneration is also controlled by just short sequences near genes. And um, you know, there, there's a, there's a number of new ideas here. Um, one of them is just the biology of it. And it, it, you know, there's a, there's an idea that regeneration and the capacity to regenerate, um, which, which differs among species, depending on the tissue could be, um, the result of having different enhancer sequences like these, or, or maybe even the loss or gain of, of those sequences. So, mm -hmm. so maybe fish can regenerate well because of certain trees, certain enhancers that, that turn on important genes during regeneration and keep them on and then shut them off at the right time that, that, that we don't have as, as mammals, which is, a, I, th I think, an interesting idea. Um, but also, as, as you, you know, maybe alluded to, um, I think, um, you know, they teach us about control of regeneration factors and, um, you know, a really important element of, of, of understanding regeneration is to understand that control. And um, naturally in zebrafish and in salamanders and in many other model systems and mice, um, it's, it, you know, it's becoming clear that, that they have enhancers that have this natural control of, of strong pro-regenerative factors. So I think there is, um, you know, there is this um, idea and we've shown it a proof of principle that you can take these enhancers and you can use them, uh, certainly in fish, you can engineer them to um, express uh, factors that, um, that they don't normally target, but you can, um, you can use them to express those genes in ways that can ultimately change regeneration, either make it better or, or make it worse. So I think there are applications for having these short DNA sequences that, um, that affect gene control um, after an injury. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of science to do to find them and to understand them, to understand what binds these factors and how they control gene expression. But there are, are applications as well, I, I think. Yeah, so you're also developing new methods for imaging of key cellular molecular events during uh, regeneration. So my question is, you know, why can't traditional imaging methods do this? Yeah, well, I think, you know, studying regeneration in adult animals brings challenges that are not there when, let's say, studying cell movements in, in young embryos. You know, the goal of imaging regeneration, which I'm, I'm very excited about, is to try to visualize, to see cells and what they're doing. Not, don't see regeneration as a tissue that's growing back, but to see it as thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cells and try to capture every behavior uh, of each of those cells all at once. And I, I think if we do that, then we, we understand how regeneration works and we can put all we are learning about genes and control of genes into the right context. Well, these are important for making cells behave in a certain way in this population. So, um, but uh, in order to visualize, you know, many cells at once, yeah, you've got, you've got to be able to image it under a mic microscope. And when you have an adult animal, you're dealing with challenges for that, let's say a fish, this animal needs, generally needs to move its gills to live. And, uh. Um, the animal's not transparent anymore. So you've got to be able to see into the tissue through tissue that's, you know, that's got pigment in it. And, and, um, and so those are the key challenges, keeping, keeping an animal happy 
and still gilling, but also regenerating. Um, and so the platforms that we use anesthetize animals. Uh, we keep them immobile, uh, but uh, also allow for uh, imaging uh, using a, a, a lens of a microscope to be, to be placed very close uh, to the animal and the animal to remain still. And we wanna capture as much time as we can, say a day or two. Um, so the, the, you know, the challenges are regeneration takes a bit of time. Mm -hmm. You've gotta keep an animal happy while it's regenerating under a microscope. And then the challenge of adult tissue that's not, not transparent. And so generally we, we work with um, tissues on the outside of an animal like skin or scales, mm -hmm. or fins, but there's also the possibility cer certainly in mice uh, to, um, to use um, intravital imaging, mm -hmm. which is put it, putting a like one would do for a surgery um, and imaging what cells are doing through a more invasive type of lens. And that's, a, that's another approach one, one can use. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but now my question is, you know, how are you able to, you know, put a fish under a microscope? Cause like, I mean, you take the fish out and like, obviously when fish are off the water, they, they can die. So my question is, is there a specific process you guys use? Yeah, 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 for sure. And, and, you know, this is part of doing, this was one of the bigger challenges to, um, you know, this, this broader goal of imaging regeneration is well, how to, how, how do we get the fish um, uh, in the right, you know, under a lens? And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a bit of engineering, but, um, you know, we have trays and we use um, an agaros gel at a certain percentage, which can keep an anesthetized fish um, uh, stable, but not... Um, but still allow us to free, free the animal and have it uh, go back into water when we're done. Um, we use a pump, a peristaltic pump to uh, flush the gills with a, a, an, a light anesthesia. And this will keep it um, anesthetized and not, not feeling any of the procedure and keep it still, but, um, uh, but also um, um, again, keep it, keep, keep it living for, for the next day. And then um, we use an overhead lens of uh, a so-called uh, confocal microscope, which uses um, uh, a laser to uh, excite fluorescent proteins in, um, in the tissue. And um, that lens can be pressed right down and, um, and can uh, a so-called water immersion lens can, can then be used to, to image uh, what's going on inside you know, inside the scales, even inside the cells of the scale. So it is a, you know, part of it's just what, you know, what can we build um, with our limited knowledge to, to get this to work? And, and what I've described to you is what we have so far. Yeah. So what is the future of um, regenerative medicine? Future of regenerative medicine? Well, I think, you know, we've touched on a lot, a lot of these. So uh, I think um, um, the first, uh, you know, I think the first set of discoveries, you know, have told us what, what cells do we need to be targeting and can we add stem cells uh, for um, uh, cellular therapy or um, do we have to think more about uh, a molecular therapy? And, you know, I, I would say the holy grail of regenerative medicine uh, is, um, at least in my view, but I, I think many others is it's not so much adding uh, cells or parts or pieces, but um, in an ideal scenario, you want to stimulate the tissue, that spared tissue after an injury, say a heart attack or a spinal cord injury. You want to stimulate it to repair itself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you think about that, it's, it's most likely a molecular therapy. And that, that would be, again, it's, it's finding drugs, but uh, also I think gene therapy has its um, has a real role to play in the future because you know with gene therapies you can deliver the factor uh, plus you can target the 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 tissue type and um, and um, uh, in theory the the 
the different cell types of that tissue. Um, and you can ask um, your gene therapy vector to deliver a specific fa factor uh, or other factors. And I guess, um, you know, the idea there is, uh, again, to try to, uh, try to wake up the tissue, to wake up regeneration. But, you know, with all this, I, again, I think one of the bigger challenges is control and it's targeting. And you don't just wanna to make tissue grow, but you wanna make it a safe therapy that returns uh, only what's, uh, you know, only what's needed. And so, you know, in the case of joint cartilage, you, you want to replace uh, the cartilage lost by um, degener degenerative joint disease but you don't want to you don't want to make more than that um, in a in a way that that creates a problem. So you know that's going to be a challenge that control aspect, and that's where you know we learn about we learn about controls from you know, from how fish do it and other highly regenerative model systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what advice do you receive during your career that shaped your professional development or success? Well, I. I've received, I mean, you get advice every day, you know, in doing this. And um, I think though, um, I think though uh, some of the things that I've, I've touched on already, and that is um, try to make a change in topic uh, at some point in your career. And naturally that's between right after you get your PhD for our field, and um, then it's natural to change, to do to study something different as a postdoc. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, I would also say to just follow the science. So not to have these kind of hardwired ideas of how things happen and what I should be studying um, and what I think the result will be, but, but just to, you know, just, just to sit back and look at your images or your results and, and follow the most exciting thing, even if it's even if it's not regeneration. You know, even if you've uh, identified a result that um, takes you in a completely new direction. And so, um, you know, I've received advice on along those lines, and, you know, multiple times. And now it's the the same advice I give to the students and the postdocs uh, in my lab and and new faculty as well. Yeah, so is there um, anything else that we didn't talk about that we should tell our audience? No, I think, um, no, I think your questions are, have been great, um, Diamond Goat. I think, um, you know, I, I think just generally, it's a really exciting time to be doing science in, in regeneration and um, also a really exciting time for applications. And so I'm, I'm just really happy uh, that you're covering this topic and that, you know, people your age are thinking about regeneration. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Pross, for being part of this episode, giving me this really nice um, opportunity to, you know, to ask you questions about zebrafishes so people can get to know more about your insights into zebrafish and how they are able to regenerate hearts and fins. Uh, again, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.